Hi, well, welcome to another one in this series. This talk is going to be a twofer because you get Agrippina the Elder and her daughter Agrippina the Younger. Agrippina the Elder was not born an old woman and she never got to be there because she died young, but that's the way the Romans designated a mother and daughter. Uh, now, Agri neither of them ever became emperors of Rome because women were excluded, but they were at the center of power in order the granddaughter, daughter-in-law, niece, sister, and wife of every emperor in the Judean, Claudian, Julio-Claudian dynasty. There's a problem in researching this period. Roman books were written on long scrolls of papyrus round on two sticks so they could be unrolled to show one page at a time. Papyrus is great stuff in the desert, which Egypt mostly is, but not so much in the humid summers of Italy. So significant parts of the books got moldy or eaten by insects or possibly interfered with because the most famous and complete surviving histories of the early emperor um, were written by Tacitus and Suetonius. And Tacitus was born 12 years before the death of Nero. So he most likely heard or read personal accounts of the period we'll be talking about. And he quotes his elders, but Suetonius didn't start writing until eight emperors later. Suetonius presents Tiberius, for example, as a relatively normal guy for an emperor. But Tacitus details one brutal episode after another in mind-numbing detail. I might as well give the trigger warning right now. If you're not comfortable with blood and guts, um, look for another period of history. I can't think of one, but you can try. <laughs> and Tacitus' whole chapter on Caligula is missing through insects or mold or maybe censorship or simple prudence. Survivors of that period were still walking around Rome when he wrote. And Agrippina the Younger wrote her memoirs. Everybody refers to them, but they're among the missing. There's no way to reconcile the history, so I've relied more on Tacitus because he's the more contemporary, more detailed than the gossip of Shusia. A less frivolous reason, Cassius Dio, writing in the second century, not only agrees with Tacitus, but significantly mentions that when the emperors were prayed for, as they routinely were in the second century, you know, a whole litany of their names and so forth, both Tiberius and Caligula were omitted. Josephus, the Jewish wars guy, also mentions the Agrippinas in history, but just as mentions, and Pliny the Elder has some references as well. One word of caution. Uh, you'll hear a lot about accusations of adultery with horrible penalties. And they were, they were flying around like yellow jackets at a picnic. The scandal quotient was really much, much lower. The first Roman emperor is known to us as Caesar Augustus. His birth name had been Gaius Octavius, but he became Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus when Julius Caesar adopted him as his heir. Such adoptions were common when there was no natural heir in the family. Augustus was added after he became emperor. Whatever he was called, he passed the Papian Popia law during his reign, instituting serious financial penalties on those who lived unmarried after a certain age. <clears throat> in other words, compelling marriage. In the scramble for spouses, a lot of miserable marriages took place and adultery became the national sport. But a good many of those accused were guilty only of being politically inconvenient to the emperor. The criminal penalties for adultery included exile and death, and they became the preferred means of getting rid of opponents. The Romans had initially welcomed the all-encompassing rule of Augustus as relief from the intermittent civil wars that had persisted through most of the previous century, and only ending in 31 BC with the Battle of Actium, in which Octavian, not yet Augustus, of course, defeated Marcus Antonius 
of Anthony and Cleopatra fame. And this new regime began. As Romans became less fond of dictatorship or made out attempts to become emperors themselves, they could be eliminated by an accusation of adultery. If they were convicted, one third of their property went to the state or one half for men. And that was kind of nice for the state. Either sex would be exiled sometimes to a barren island where the exile of either gender could be forgotten and quietly starved to death, beaten to death or poisoned. It was a perfect scheme. A dissident might have a point and why allow him to disturb the peace? The partner of the target was obviously collateral damage, but you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. With all that aside, let's go to Rome. The beginning of the emperor. Slide one is the Roman Forum at the time of Augustus. It's obviously an artist's rec reconstruction because all of these buildings were built around and burned down and reconstructed and fell apart. You won't see it this way. The unpretentious building over here was the Senate House. Now we can go ahead, I think, yes, to the Senate House and there's the outside and there's the interior. Augustus turned the Republican, Republic into a totalitarian state while leaving the structure of the Republic in place. It was a case of boiling lobster slowly. For example, during the Republic, the senators were appointed by the consuls, who were in turn elected by the Committee of Centurions, the Assembly of the Centuries. The Assembly was probably the inspiration of our House of Representatives, and it sounds very Republican with a small r, but the centuries were groups of 100, and these were ranked by class, patricians or nobles, the wealthy, that's not from trade, heaven forbid, the equites or knights who did the banking and the merchanting and all of those necessary things, everybody else, the plebeians, the freedmen, the slaves, um, was below them. The wealthiest centuries voted first. Voting was stopped after a majority was reached, so the plebeians often lost their voice. As for the Senate, there was a property requirement of one million sesterces on Roman coin, and that's an equivalent of about one billion US dollars. Certain officers of Rome were automatically enrolled in the Senate when they finished their term. The Senate now functioned as an advisory body but though their power was less, they still commanded great respect. The office of consul had been discontinued during the Civil War. It was restored by Augustus, which looked like a victory for the Republican minded, but then he got the Senate to assign him the functions of consuls, including appointment of the senators and the supreme command of the military. Game and match. Rome was now under the rule of a single man the emperor. It wasn't the nobility now, but the Roman populace who liked having an emperor, who was usually very indulgent towards them and sometimes scattered a bunch of these sesterces or even gold coins around. They were against any return to the Republic and the Civil War. Now getting back here, gladiator games took place over here in the open space where the people are standing and the chariot is running around. The Colosseum wasn't built until 16 years after the death of Nero. The forum was definitely not a residential area. Even the emperor and other important persons lived on the Palatine of one of the other six hills comprising Rome. Here's the exterior of the house of Livia, which may or may not have been the residence of the wife of Augustus. And here's a comparable type of interior of such a house. And you can see the beautiful frescoes that they did at this time. There are some in the Metropolitan Museum, but they're vastly inferior to the usual type. 
Okay. Now let us go ahead and look at the family tree of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. You'll notice one thing. This tr family tree doesn't fork. Everybody wanted their kid to grow up to be emperor. And the one with the most DNA from Livia and Augustus over here also uh, one, especially if he, because women were not eligible, also had a progenitor descended from Augustus' sister, Octavia, the fourth wife of Mark Anthony, thus uniting both sides with her. The emperor started off pretty bad and got considerably worse. Maybe this was from interbreeding, I'm not saying, or just the absolute power corrupting absolutely thing. A chance meeting between Augustus and Livia Drusilla, and there they are, in 39, triggered bilateral passion. And within a year, Augustus divorced his wife for Gerbonia on the day that she gave birth to the couple's only child, Julia, the mother of our first Agrippina. And let's look at that. Here's Julia, you see, and over here, yeah, here's Scribonia, she's gone. Here's Julia, and here are her sons, direct descendants of Augustus, prime candidates for emperor. Augustus, of course, married Livia, who divorced her spouse, Tiberius Claudius Nero. And you'll see these names over and over and over again. We do the same thing. You know, there's George W. Bush and there's the other Bush, but they did it in excess. It makes it really a pain to follow who they're talking about the family without the family tree. So you'll see this a lot from time to time. I hope it clears things up. And she came to him with baby Tiberius, this guy who became the emperor later, who was her son by Tiberius Claudius Nero. Now, Augustus wanted someone from his bloodline to succeed him on the throne. So he adopted Tiberius, as a kind of sop to uh, Livia. Um, but although Tiberius was not born to him and people wondered a little bit whether Drusus might have been his son because of the marriage taking place when she was pregnant with it, um, neither of them officially had his DNA. He decided to fix the problem by detaching his fertile Julia, daughter, Julia, from her husband, Agrippa, goodbye, and Tiberius, whom he has adopted, from his wife, Vipsania, and marrying her to Tiberius which gave him, you know, this line directly to Julia's children, whom she had from Agrippa, but now through Tiberius. And one of those children was Agrippina the Elder, who is now Agrippina not Elder. Marcus Agrippa, had been a staunch supporter of his and brilliant military general, but what the heck, in the struggle for heirs, who cares? Julia already had these three sons and two daughters by Agrippa, one of which was Agrippina. To distinguish her from her daughter, she's called the elder, Agrippina the younger. Tiberius, who loved his wife, Vipsania, had no children by Julia. He didn't like her, and he put her aside as fast as he could. 
Ad Augustus adopted the two of Julia's boys, as you can see over here, with the adoption dotted line, and gave them precedence over Tiberius as, as his heirs because they did have his bloodline and Tiberius had none. But Livia had other ideas. Of course, Livia wanted her son to be emperor, wouldn't you? So Lucius died suddenly aged 18 in 2 CE on his way to Hispania to acquire some military training. And his brother Caius, aged 21, dropped dead in Armenia a few months later. And there they aren't. Both Tacitus and Cassius Steele imply that Livia sent agents with poison to kill the two young men. If not, deaths so close together of two young active men 2,000 miles apart seem statistically unlikely. And Agrippina probably, you know, you, you lose two brothers, it's kind of sad. Now, Julia had one other son, Agrippa Posthumus, but he was violent and obnoxious and nobody liked him. He was slaughtered by a centurion the day of Augustus' death in 14 CE or one day after. The centurion somehow thought Tiberius had ordered the murder and reported it as part of it. Yeah, I did it to Tiberius, now emperor. But Tiberius said, no, no, I never told you that and threatened him with arrest if he ever said it again. Others said Augustus had a standing order to kill Agrippa posthumous within one hour of his own death. Now, Livia went to work on Tiberius' female relatives because they might marry and have children without her DNA. She had Tiberius dis despised wife, Julia, accused of adultery, here we go, not, which was not improbable in this case since Tiberia would have, Tiberius would have nothing to do with her. And so Julia was exiled along with her daughter, Julia, Caesarus, sister to Agrippina. So now her mother and her daughter are gone. In order to replace Lucius and Gaius in the succession, Augustus commanded Tiberius to adopt a nephew of his known as Germanicus, this guy. Thus making him second in line after Tiberius. This put a target on Germanicus's back. Germanicus to trace his ancestry back to Octavia and Mark Antony over there. And so his marriage to Agrippina, when she was age 16, by the way, united the two branches of the dynasty. It was a storybook marriage. Germanicus owed his name Germanicus was given to him, to his father's military exploits in Germany, when, which he himself would soon surpass in three campaigns, putting down the rebellions of the German tribes and avenging the loss by his predecessor, Varus, of three Roman legions in the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, which I believe I have a slide of. Uh, now, um, just to uh, just to interject, the Tulbuk uh, Forest was one of the first major defeats, and um, in that in that battle, um, I believe it's uh, Arminius who uh, used to be part of the um, Roman. Uh, I think he was he he was one of the centurions of, uh, or you know generals for Roman army, and then. Therefore, uh, defected back to his tribe, uh, who was named Cherokees, and um, they were able to ambush and uh, take over an eagle, 
uh, which is, as you can see, Eagle is at the bottom, uh, was the um, was a no-no for Roman army. Whenever they, they lose the Eagle, that means that uh, basically uh, that particular, um, I, I forget the name of the legion, was disbanded. Um, I don't know. Uh, Greg, you have anything to add to the Burke uh, Forest? Uh, um, I'm sorry to interject, uh, Jane. Uh, no, no, I'm happy. Um, Greg? But Jane, were, were, you, were you planning to uh, uh, talk about that at all? Jane? Oh, no, no, I, I just mentioned uh, it as Germanicus' uh, um, resume. Uh, yeah, Germanicus uh, later on, uh, kind of as, as Iberia started, but Germanicus later on retrieved. Actually, he lost four legions uh, uh, and four uh, eagles. Uh, so he, he managed to retrieve two. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, he defeated, but not not completely. Uh, so uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why he was given that name, uh, because uh, he uh, conducted a successful campaign. Uh, however, he didn't uh, recover everything. Uh, Greg, it's uh, hard to hear you. Uh, is there a way maybe you could uh, close? Uh, really? Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, Okay, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's a like bad trembling, trembling voice. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, all right, I guess. Uh, <laughs> well, let me see. No, no, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, go ahead. Okay. Go it's ahead. muffled. It's a little bit muffled, so to speak. So. Uh huh. Okay. All right. It's okay. Uh, uh, Go on. Continue. Please. No, okay. no, I'm fine. Uh, it's not. <laughs> so just one, one more thing is um, uh, Germanicus is a, you know, as we know, and then and obviously Jane is going to come to that, but he's, he was very well liked by uh, a Roman uh, army. And then I'm sure you're going to mention who he was. So sorry. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, Agrippina adored. Can you imagine putting your body into this? I, I just don't know how people actually do do that. And by the way, here they are. This is Agrippina the Elder, and this is her husband Germanicus. And these are contemporary. All my all my statues are contemporary, but obviously the paintings aren't. Agrippina adored her husband. Everybody adored him. Germanicus was handsome, yeah, kind, a heroic soldier, a superb commander. He pacified the provinces at least as much by diplomacy as open war. Agrippina was the ideal Roman wife. She bore five children that was important to the Romans, besides her namesake. While most Roman military wives stayed home, she went with him to the dangerous posts in Germany, where one of the kids dressed in a military uniform, complete with tiny military boots, how cute, called Caliga, became the pet of all the soldiers. And she was create, courageous. One episode, Germanicus and his family were at a Roman outpost being threatened by a large force of Germans. And Germanicus ordered some of the soldiers to take her, because she was pregnant at the time, and the children to safety with the main army. They marched off a little ways, and once out of earshot of Germanicus, Agrippina would have none of that and demanded to be taken back. There was a dispute. Agrippina won, although she allowed the children to be evacuated, and she marched the soldiers back to camp. Tiberius heard about this. He said it was a serious crime for a woman to be countermanded in military orders. But Germanicus was too popular for Tiberius to take action against Agrippina. A little later, Agrippina, now more advanced in pregnancy, was sheltering in a friendly town, and she may have saved that part of the Roman army that was under Germanicus. A detachment of them were in flight with the Germans in hot pursuit. Their safety lay in the town where Agrippina was, and that was connected with a bridge to the Romans' path of flight. The townspeople were terrified and started to demolish the bridge until Agrippina calmly walked out on it alone and visibly pregnant, 
carrying bandages and food, which he gave out to the wounded and exhausted legionnaires as they crossed to safety. The townsmen, ashamed of their cowardice, allowed the bridge to stand until the last Roman had safely crossed. Both Libya and Tiberius united for once, realized both Agrippina and Germanicus would have to be eliminated. They were becoming far too popular, almost to the point of worship. Germanicus had the backing of the entire army, and though he had turned down one attempt of theirs to make him emperor already, there would always be the chance that he'd accept the next one. People might easily believe Germanicus would make a better emperor than Tiberius. Tiberius might have started well, all the emperors did, but he slowly lapsed into dissipation and a paranoia so extreme that he left Rome in the 20th year of 12th year of his reign, 26 CE, took up residence in Capri and never returned, though he remained emperor officially, that is. It wouldn't take much for a revolution to form around Germanicus and Agrippina. The one attempt I mentioned happened in Germany. The Roman troops stationed there were in revolt. They'd been underpaid and overworked for years, and the term of service was 20 years, at which point they re could retire if they survived. Yeah, would you like 20 years of what I just showed up there? They wanted more pay, and the term reduced to 16 years. They were at the point of mutiny when Germanicus refused to go along. The soldiers seized Agrippina and little Caius to enforce their demands, but Germanicus remained firm, even threatening suicide if they persisted. When the mutiny was put down, which was apparently by a lunar eclipse that scared the troops, Tiberius sent envoys to thank Germanicus for his obedience and gave him a triumph. But the affair had, that was a big parade you got um, to bring your chariots and everything into Rome and show off your captives and so forth and so on. Everybody loved it. But the affair had scared Tiberius and a scared Tiberius was dangerous. Germanicus was assigned to oversee the whole of Rome's Eastern provinces, which sounds awesome, but it was deliberately chosen because those provinces are far from Rome and Germany and Germanicus' is the center of support. Tiberius to directed him to Syria to oversee the government of the province, which was apparently a mess. The governor of Syria was near Calpurnius Piso. Piso resented the interference and clashed seriously with Germanicus, perhaps to cool things off or because it was desperately needed. Germanicus made an ill-considered side trip to Egypt to deal with the famine there. Egypt was not in Germanicus' mandate, but the famine was real and the Egyptians were starving. While he was gone, Piso undid all of Germanicus's appointments and regulations, possibly at the instigation of Tiberius. Tiberius was furious with Germanicus because Egypt was officially off limits to anyone with senatorial rank or uh, one of the officers like that. Since it was the breast basket of Rome and anyone interfering there could starve the city. Germanicus had gone on his own initiative despite the prohibition, which he most surely knew. On Germanicus' return to Syria, he and Piso quarreled even more bitterly, and Germanicus became ill, convinced Piso was poisoning him. Piso left, but the poison's effect, if it was indeed poison, continued and Germanicus died his body covered with the dark stains supposed to be a sign of poison. We tend to discount the popular medical science of the ancient world, and some, yes, is downright silly, but they had this right. My armchair diagnosis, for what it's worth, would be disseminated in intravascular coagulation, which can be caused by snake bite toxin, whether or not administered by snake. I'll show a slide of what it looks like, but please, if, the, if this kind of thing upsets you and I can understand, just close your eyes until I say it's okay. Now, let's go on. Oh, I went, did I go back? Yes, I did. 
yeah, take a quick look at that. And now it is okay to look. Um, Agrippina was desolate. She returned to Rome via Brindisium where her boat had docked. She stepped from the boat with Germanicus urn clasped to her breast and little Caligula and Agrippina carried alongside. A carriage awaited her with a thousand guardsmen sent by Tiberius to ride beside her and keep the people from making too much of a support of her, by the way. And they all walked together the final miles to Rome where you couldn't ride because the rules said you couldn't, not because the roads were bad. The roads were very good. Adoring crowds joined the procession, clothed in black and burning incense and kept in order by the guardsmen. The guardsmen may have been sent by Tiberius, but he remained at home, nor did he give any subsequent sign of warning other than issuing a statement that though officers were mortal, but Rome must go on. He didn't attend Germanicus's funeral or his entombment in the mausoleum of his adopted grandfather, Augustus. Tiberius became even more paranoid as time went on. His fear of revolt and assassination grew, and so he formed close ties with the head of the Praetorian Guard, Lucius Ilius Sejanus, or Sejanus, and gentlemen of the co-host and host variety, if you can tell me which way to pronounce it, I'll be happy. I, I saw both on Google. No? Okay. I will say Sejanus. The Praetorians were a special unit tasked with protesting the emperor. So close did Tiberius and Sejanus become that Tiberius called him the partner of my labors. Isn't that sweet? Sejanus was and equate that class is called knight or equestrian in some books, not a noble, but he had ambitions of becoming emperor one day. He began where Livia left off in the elimination of Tiberius' heirs. Sejanus disposed of Drusus Julius Caesar, I believe is this guy, yes. Tiberius' son by his first wife. Yes, confirmed, Vipsanio. And he did it by seducing this lady, Drusus' wife, the villa. If Tacitus and Cassius Dio are right, she didn't put up too much of a fuss when Sejanus asked her to poison Drusus, which she promptly did. Sejanus had promised to marry her, and, you know, he told her he asked Tiberius permission, but was refused because of his lower caste. Germanicus, Tiberius' adopted son, would have been next in line, but he was dead. You know, he isn't. So his male children, Drusus Caesar and Nero Caesar, moved up the air ladder to the top rung, and we all know what that means. Meanwhile, Sejanus was operating as if he were the emperor. Statues of him began appearing all over Rome, including one paired with that of Tiberius and flanking an altar of friendship. Official prayers were offered for Sejanus' health, just like those offered for the emperor. Livia died in 29 CE. Tiberius didn't visit her during her last illness. He forbade her pro forma deification. She wasn't going to be a goddess. The last restraint on Sejanus was gone, and the time had come to, for him to eliminate the last of Tiberius's heirs. Sejanus convinced Tiberius that Agrippina was plotting to put Drusus and Nero Caesar on the throne without waiting for Tiberius to become a god. Tiberius' suspicion was firmly confirmed when prayers in the Senate were offered for Drusus and Nero Caesar, along with the mandated prayers to him on his birthday, thus elevating their statue way above the danger point. 
Together with Sejanus, Tiberius was drawing a net around Agrippina, if you can see. I mean, Agrippa is already gone, if I may remind you. I just didn't bother putting an X on him. Uh, um, can, I, can I add something? Can you hear sure. me? You, you hear me all right? Yes, yes, very well, very well. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, on Agrippina's uh, side, she was actually convinced that it was Tiberius who uh, poisoned uh, Drusus, uh, the Germanicus. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Germanicus was his nephew, but he was way too popular with an army, and that that's, uh, that was pretty dangerous. So Agrippina was convinced, and she was determined to uh, expose uh, Tiberius. So that, that that's another reason. It's not it's not only a, a Sejanus uh, uh, conviction, but uh, there were some uh, actions on the side of Agrippina that made uh, Tiberius very very upset and uh, uh, desire to get rid of her and her children. Yeah, um, and there's more on that. I'll get to that. There's a, uh -huh. a whole network of things that right. you know, went on between the two of them. Okay. Um, uh, before we get to that, Jane, quick question to you. So you've mentioned the, uh, uh, the use of poison. Now, um, I know that in the courts of, you know, uh, in Greece and Athens, a lot of the, uh, so to speak, court women had used poison quite significantly. And then that, was this happening also in Rome, where the poison was used to eliminate your, the opponent or somebody you didn't like, so to speak? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, as a matter um, of fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, Livia was a master poisoner. <laughs> you know, she no. had the, right? <laughs> it was, yeah, Locusta was the favorite contractor you, you got in touch with. Hi, I need somebody off, you know? Do we know, um, sorry, maybe it's off topic, but do we know of the um, variety of substances? I'm not, not particularly named, but how you know elaborate they would get you know uh, as far as the poison is concerned and and what would it be used like drinks food uh, I don't know you know touching something <laughs> how how no 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 know. they didn't have the umbrella tip thing go going yet but um, this was usually the food and that's why they had tasters and they would get around it they had dodges you know the the tea was too hot and they drop an ice cube in and the ice cube would um, they had ice, by the way, and uh, it, that would that would melt and the poison and so forth. I just um, I just did the thing on the disseminated uh, intravascular co coagulation, which could easily have been snake bite toxin. They knew about that, and they think they could draw snake bite toxin and reuse it and use it without the snake getting involved. Um, and when we get to uh, one of the other emperors, I don't want to spoil it. Um, there is another thing about poison and we'll get to yes or no on that yeah. too. But uh, if I may, going back about Livia, who was mother of Tiberius and, and wife of uh, Augustus, and she was very determined to get her son uh, to become a successor. Uh, she uh, eliminated, supposedly, I mean, it's not 100% proven, but uh, suspicion were that she eliminated uh, a Marcellus, Claudius Marcellus, uh, 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 who was actually, uh, uh, before his death, was officially a, a, a crown prince, uh, if, I, if I may say so. Uh, you know, it was um, uh, Augustus wanted him to uh, succeed. Uh, and he was a son of Octavia, so that's uh, that's one of the things. Uh, 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 Augustus' sister, so he had. So the, the one of the things uh, that uh, Livia did in her rule is she was a very dangerous woman, and uh, she had a bad reputation about poisoning all her enemies, uh, left and right. Yes, I think there was a BBC series or something about her. Yeah, yeah, um, there is a BBC series about her. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but again, oh, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but she was she was the evil of all evils in that one. Right. Um, I I would believe it, you know. That but she there she, were, uh, she had competition in the evil department. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, of course. 
but um, uh, no, it, she wasn't uh, so bad uh, in, in that series. I mean, the, the, uh, all of them were bad there. Uh, I mean, she wasn't any particular like uh, worse than others, <laughs> but but uh, uh, just shown very uh, cynical world. Um, uh, but she actually had a reputation. That, uh, everybody was afraid of her. She she probably did conduct a number of poisoning. I don't know about Marcella specifically. It's not hundred percent. Well, all of these orange crosses are basically her work. These three, um, yeah. these are her work too, but they were um, killed judicially with accusations and exiles. That's more of um, Tiberius's work. Uh, that's her. That was her work too, obviously, because she didn't want them getting married and, and money up the uh, the air structure. But the ones that she actively poisoned, well, Julia Lavilla poisoned uh, Drusus, but um, that was at the behest of Sejanus. She, if she poisoned anybody directly, it was Lucius, Gaius, and probably uh, Germanicus as well, those three. And uh, no doubt many others, but they're not on my, on my talk. <laughs> And somebody else. Now, a stupid question. Germanicus was part of the Julius, uh, so descent, you know, uh, Julius clan, right? Uh, and uh, why wasn't he chosen uh, initially, you know, in in the line of emperors? Um, he he would he would be chosen. He was nephew of Tiberius. He was a son of his brother, who also had a Germ uh, uh, name, Germanicus. Uh, his brother was Drusus Germanicus, and his the son of his was also uh, Drusus Germanicus, the one who married Agrippina. So he would be a successor, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, well, he was so popular with an army that uh, who, who who knows <laughs> they they wouldn't maybe wait until Tiberius' death. Well, the one of the big things was to unite this branch of the family from Julius Caesar with this branch of the family, uh, the Claudian, that's why it's called the Julio-Claudian branch. And if you got the, if you got children who came from both branches, that was rock solid. That was, you know, the, the tip of Everest or something. Now, that's why I said right at the beginning, this family tree just plain doesn't fork. So by this time, everybody's marrying some degree of um, being a relative. And by the time it gets down to uh, down to here, it, it's, well, with Claudius and all that, um, you're getting uncle-niece um, marriages, or at least one. So uh, if I may go on, where am I? <laughs> okay. Um, they're gone. And together with Sejanus, Tiberius was drawing a net around Agrippina, uh, accusing and convicting her friends of various crimes, including adultery, of course, and extortion, slowly but surely undermining her support. Her cousin and dearest friend, Claudia Polka, was condemned to death for mostly sexual crimes, but also of planning to poison Tiberius. Agrippina burst on Tiberius when he was at prayer, protesting furiously. It did not add to her popularity with him. At the same time, some of Sejanus's Praetorian Guard, acting under his orders, convinced Agrippina that Tiberius intended to poison her. And she sat next to the emperor in silence at one banquet. Of course, she had to attend and invited, not touching her food and pointedly putting aside an apple that he offered to her. Even thinking bad thoughts about the emperor officially called Mestas was treason that could be prosecuted and public gestures indicating fear of poisoning by the emperor was risky if not suicidal behavior. Meanwhile, Sejanus spied on Nero Caesar Agrippina, the elder son, by her first marriage. Here we are. 
using Nero Caesar's wife, who is an honest thing, confidences to her mother, and who was Nero Caesar's mother-in-law, but Julia Lavilla. What did I say about intermarriage? And of course, that was his mistress, that was Sejanus's mistress. to provide evidence of Nero's bad thoughts about Tiberius. Now that Drusus, Tiberius' son, was dead, Nero Caesar was the obvious successor. Sejanus promised Drusus Caesar, his brother, that he could be emperor if Nero was put out of the way. So he got Drusus to inform on his brother. And then, Sejanus seduced Drusus' wife, Amelia, and made her spy on Drusus. Lovely family. Tearfully trying to patch things up and maybe save her children, Agrippina begged Tiberius to let her remarry, promising that she'd retreat from the fray and stay at home if he would grant her plea. Tiberius refused. Her isolation was now almost total, and the game was to increase it. Sejanus delivered dossiers on both the Nero Caesar and Drusus Caesar to Tiberius. Agrippina didn't need a dossier, as she had been upfront about her suspicions of the emperor and her violent opposition to the elimination of her friends. The result was that Tiberius sent letters to the Senate, accusing all three of them of mastus. Nero of sexual crimes, that is, sex with men, Agrippina prosecuted for her bad thoughts and with incest with Nero Caesar thrown in to humiliate her and eliminate him. The people of Rome protested. They still cherish the memory of Germanicus and her bravery, and they knew what was going on, but the Senate was in the line of fire and they wanted to live and they began the prosecutions. Agrippina was exiled to Panaderia, where a centurion was sent to beat her every week and once so badly that she lost an eye. Sources differ on whether she was starved to death or refused to eat to end the torture. Nero was sent to Panza, near enough for Capri to Tiberius to keep an eye on things, but far away from Agrippina. A year later, accusations of plotting against Tiberius were aimed at Drusus, who was over here, despite all the useful sp spying on his brother. Instead of supreme power, he was in prison and died of starvation in 33. There was no question of suicide. He'd eaten the straw of his mattress in a vain attempt to stay alive. And now, if we move on, They're gone. And we have Agrippina the Younger. From now on, I'll to call her Agrippina because her mother is dead and there won't be any confusion. Had been married off by imperial demand when she was 13 years of age to the rich but reputedly unpleasant Nias Domitius Ahinobarbus. I think it means red beard. In 28, their only child was Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, who was born nine years later. We'll drop him from the narrative for now, but he'll be back. Nius Domitius was noble, rich, and non-political. Agrippina was safe, if temporary. Her sister Drusilla was married to Lucius Caesar Longinus. Tiberius had provided the required care for the orphans he had made. As for little Caligula, remember the teeny military boots? Agrippina's brother, he was only 14 when Tiberius decamped to Capri. Tiberius took him along as a playmate and thoroughly corrupted him. Despite all the moral outrage about adultery and so forth, the reports coming back from Capri depicted a polysexual pleasure carnival with no limits. If you saw the movie Caligula, you'll have some idea of what he learned on Capri. But remember, there are some prohibitions on what 
could and can be shown in theaters. Meanwhile, Sejanus was growing ever stronger, now serving as consul along Tiberius. Every one of Tiberius' partners in the consulate had died in office or slightly later, but Sejanus was planning to have it the other way. Both the Senate and the Praetorian Guard were in his pocket and he thought himself invulnerable. But Tiberius had finally put two and two together. He knew he would lose a direct confrontation with his partner in his labors. So he carefully fostered Sejanus' solutions and would bid farewell to him after his visits to Capri. Sejanus was based in Rome running the country with public embraces and even tears. Here is Cassius Dio's account of the final act. Statues of Sejanus were giving omens of bad fortune. Smoke emerged from one, and when its head was removed to investigate, a snake slithered out of its neck. Sejanus thought the populace was with him. The reign of terror had fallen mostly on the patricians, but when Caius Caesar, Caligula to be, was proposed as the next emperor rather than himself, the people cheered. Their love for Germanicus was undiminished. Encouraged, Tiberius passed laws making the governors of provinces immune to the kind of charges Sejanus had been using so successfully against them in past years. He forbade sacrifices made to any except gods because Sejanus was still, so far, only a human. These were straws in the wind but people got the point and started to leave the room when Sejanus appeared. In the fall of 31, Tiberius realized he was strong enough to act and that he'd better act immediately. He announced that Sejanus would be appointed tribune, a powerful post that began as a representative of the people, believe it or not. Then he sent Macro, the head of Tiberius's bodyguard on Capri to Rome. Macro entered Rome by night with one, a secret appointment of himself as head of the Praetorians, two, some really nice gifts for the Praetorians, and three, a letter of denunciation of Janus to be read at the next meeting of the Senate, which was to be held at the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill. The next morning, Macro met Sejanus and told him the Senate was to vote that day to appoint him tribune. Sejanus hastened to the meeting only to have the vote delayed by the reading of Tiberius' letter, which was a slow crescendo of accusations of ascending criminality. Those senators seated nearest to Sejanus prudently removed to distant seats. A vote was taken, completing this coup from above. Sejanus was imprisoned this is his arrest. Condemned and executed the next day along with his children. And just to give you an idea of the, this very civilized classical civilization, his young daughter was assaulted by the executioner because the killing of virgins was illegal. Some accounts reduce this to a simple stabbing outside the Senate house. This one seems more believable. Tiberius only committed legal murders. Uh, even emperors die. Tiberius' end came of partly natural causes in 37. He was 79 years old, and despite occasional displays of physical bravado, he was visibly slowing down. The end came in a luxury villa on Cape Messino near Naples. He went to bed after a banquet and couldn't be roused the next morning. Word went out that he was dead. Caligula must have been with him because he celebrated to the max until it was reported that Tiberius was breathing again. Macro went to Tiberius' room and suffocated him. Caligula was now the emperor. He disposed of Macro and his wife in his first year. He recalled his sister Agrippina, the younger, from her exile and went bragging to all and sundry of incest with all three sisters. The others were Drusilla and Julia Lavilla, demanded that they be given all the privileges of the Vestal Virgins, including seats in the royal box at the Gladiator Games. You know, status in Rome 
was very, very important. And these things, we think they're nothing, but they were really tremendously meaningful to them. Prayers were said for the sisters along with usual prayers for him as emperor. Whether or not the sisters, sisters participated willingly in the incest isn't known. The alternative would have been to jump in the nearest fire to preserve their chastity and all of them were long past that point anyway. Despite the bragging, Caligula is reported to have been incested from zero to three of his sisters, depending on the source. Marcus Aurelius Lepidus, Drusilla's husband, was said to be Caligula's lover and a participant in the incest rebels. Caligula was also reported to requisition the wives of everybody else for sets, sometimes taking them for a banquet and returning them to their husbands with comments on the performance in his bed. According to Suetonius, Tacitus simply admits, omits Caligula's reign entirely. Caligula's sins were not limited to the sexual. He had Lepidus executed, then turned against the sisters suddenly for no known reason and exiled them to Ponza where Nero Caesar had died. He demanded that Agrippina carry Lepidus's bones to Ponza as her mother had carried Germanicus's ashes home from Syria. I won't continue the dismal recitations of hundreds of maybe probably thousands of executions and other horrors of his reign, but I can't resist the following stupid but non-lethal episode. At great expense to the state, not to him, in search of military glory, when there was no war to fight, Caligula personally led a small army to Britain, marched them to the sea in full armor, boy, and ordered them to pick up seashells and then march them home again. Finally, everybody had had enough. Two members of the Praetorian Guard, Cassius Chiria and Cornelius Sabinus, formed a conspiracy to assassinate him, and he was stabbed into helplessness as he prepared to dance in the theater. He loved being the center of attention. Others crowded around to help by stabbing him and even tearing his flesh with their teeth if they had no other weapon. Here is Cassius Dio's final word, final word on Caligula. So Caius, who accomplished all these exploits in three years, nine months, and 28 days, learned by actual experience that he was not a god. Okay, so let us go on. I have a question here. Um, sure. Uh, Jane. So uh, Erica asked, do you know of a tricks used to avoid forced marriage? What? Do you know of a, do you know of a tricks used during those times to avoid forced marriage? Um, no, is there one? No, but back in the days, in uh, Roman times. In the Roman all, times, all no. Forced. <laughs> no, I don't know of any trick to avoid it. You could be over, I think, 60, and if you were male, you couldn't. Um, actually, women who had been widowed or divorced were forced to marry within one year. I don't know how anybody avoided it. You could become Vestal Virgin if it's the first time. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing is about... Uh, you know, Vestalcus or Vest Virgins. Uh, does anybody know what it is? So basically, you know, if, Greg, if you want to explain what, what you know, we just said, uh, it's an interesting concept. Um, uh, well, it's just a very ancient uh, Roman uh, religious tradition uh, to have uh, uh, six uh, Vestal Virgins. They are basically... Uh, they had a special house uh, and uh, they were performing a lot of uh, rituals um, and uh, they were uh, definitely had to be virgins. They're usually from a, a senatorial rank uh, and it's a great privilege and a, a position of a power for a woman uh, in that society, uh, definitely. And uh, But they they could not have any relationships uh, with anybody. Uh, it was punishable by a cruel uh, execution. Uh, they were buried alive uh, if they lose virginity. By, <laughs> but um, otherwise, <laughs> you know, it's um, uh, you know, it's a, a very old tradition. It goes from the 
almost to the time of the foundation of the Rome. You so, know, it's, yeah. Just to add to it, thank you, Greg. Uh, and again, jumping ahead, um, Caligula, who is known to be uh, quite crazy, uh, was had had actually uh, uh, forced sex with those uh, vest virgins, and therefore one of the reasons that he was assassinated as well, which was brought to him as a as allegations, is that the fact that he did that and uh, he was not allowed to do that. And most important thing of the vest virgins is. They were supposed to keep the fire going in the yes. town. So that's the most important piece of the of the uh, puzzle. All right, I'm gonna digress, sorry. No, no, that's all That's all really interesting. Unfortunately, there were only six of them. So, and becoming a Vestal Virgin was really difficult. So I don't think that that was a practical way of avoiding marriage. But the other thing is obviously, as I've talked, you see that, at least the period, the powerful people, the women didn't have any say in who they were going to get to marry. These, they, And I don't think the men had either. I mean, the emperor would just say, you and you married. And that was it. It's not the best way to be. But maybe it works. Who knows? Arranged marriages work for people too. Okay. So we pass on to Claudius. This is Caligula. And this is Claudius. And he grew up um, with people kind of making fun of the way he looked and so forth. I'll get to that. According to the most popular story, Claudius was found cowering behind or under something and was dragged out to become the emperor. It may or may not be a true story, but the Praetorians would have wanted the pliable figurehead they thought they could control. Whether or not Claudius had been chosen by him, by them before and or not, or been complicit in the choice, is it not? Claudius had spent his life writing history and serving as the butt of jokes about his infirmities, unimpressive physique, weak voice, and shakiness. Um, Livia particularly felt kind of disgrace that he was in the family, and she just didn't want to have anything to do with him. He, for her, he was just dirty. Unexpected and unprepared for emperorship, he managed to calm the chaos succeeding Caligula's assassination. On the news of Caligula's death, Romans had rioted in the street for monarchy, for republic. There was always a group of people, a large one, that wanted to restore the republic for settlement of grievances against the government and against each other. The Senate was torn apart with infighting barely functional. Claudius had the monies from the treasury brought to the capital for safekeeping. He abolished the racist tiles for treasonous speech and thought, liberated all those imprisoned for that reason and declined to pursue those who had made fun of him. He took whatever steps he could towards lowering the taxes, which had ballooned along with Caligula's insatiable extravagance. He executed two Praetorians, the very ones who had led the assassination of Caligula, even though he'd become emperor thereby, simply because killing an emperor is in fact a crime. Um, could I uh, intercede yeah. for one second? Just wanted to say the role of the Praetorian Guard was very uh, important because they were called king makers. You know, they, they were the ones who... Uh, very often established the, the emperor because they're the only uh, force, military force allowed within the uh, city of Rome. And uh, as you remember, the Sejanus, uh, Sejanus uh, and Macro were, were, the, were both uh, in turn perfect, uh, perfect uh, of the Praetorian guards. It's a, it's a very powerful position. I mean, you, you can't, of course, uh, uh, dominate the Senate, but you, could, you know, all the assassinations and Caligula obviously was also assassinated by Praetorian guard. You know, uh, Tiberius uh, most likely was uh, strangled by. Uh, uh, Macro, who is uh, also a prefecto. So it's, it's uh, uh, and even further in Roman history, Praetorian Guard played a bigger and bigger role in, in establishing the new emperor and establishing the power. Yep, and there's even a Mozart opera, La Clemenza di Tito, Titus, uh, in which the major role is the head of the Praetorian Guard. 
Okay, so most important um, for our purposes, Claudius brought Agrippina and her sister Julia Lavilla back from Ponza. Drusilla died in Rome before their exile. Claudius had been unfortunate in his early life. In particular, Livia made fun of him and he was barely mentioned in Augustus' will. And yet the whole equestrian order stood up and removed their cloaks to respect him when he entered the amphitheater uh, for the games. And the Senate made him an extraordinary member of the priests of the deified Augustus. Part of this came from being Germanicus' brother, but part was genuine affection and respect. Not that Claudius was perfect. He loved wine more than he should have and sex the same. The wine disposed him to sex and the sex gave women too much influence with him. He was sorely in need of a wife. When Claudius came of age to marry, his first betrothal was canceled for political reasons. The second engagement ended when the bride died on the wedding day. That him to Ali Khan in France as well. His first actual marriage was to Messalina, whose name has echoed down the ages as the epitome of sluttiness, which Claudius didn't seem to mind. <coughs> he had a bunch of mistresses himself. Now, I have another slide here. And there we have um, Messalina holding her little child, Britannicus. She doesn't look all that gorgeous. And here is Agrippina the Younger. Messalina bore Claudius two children before marrying somebody else with great pomp and expense, but without mentioning it to Claudius or bothering with a divorce. She was informed on by Narcissus, Claudius' confident and freedman who warned her him that her new partner might be planning to replace him, not just in her bed, but as the emperor. According to Cassius Dio, an enraged Claudius interrupted the wedding reception, dragged her out of hiding and killed her with his own hands, which is very dramatic. But Tacitus reports a drumhead trial of the groom and other men involved, right down to the ballet dancer, Nesta, a favorite boy toy of Messalina's. They were all killed. At that point, Tacitus continues, Claudius wavered. He was indeed addicted to Messalina until Narcissus took him on a tour of the honeymoon villa. There he saw all the items, some of great personal value to him, such as mementos of his children that had been stolen from the palace and brought there. Eventually, Narcissus prevailed. And while Messalina lay at her mother's feet, refusing to kill herself, chicken, Narcissus struck, struck the final blow. Messalina had always been jealous of Agrippina. As the daughter of Germanicus, Agrippina's heritage made her seem far above Messalina's, although they were both in the direct line of descent from Augustus. Claudius wasn't yet emperor when he married Messalina, and there was little probability of his becoming one. Although five years older than Messalina at 26, Agrippina was strikingly beautiful. Hence, Agrippina also needed to be married, staying alive while the focus of Messalina's jealousy could be difficult. Messalina had been jealous of Agrippina's last remaining sister, Lavilla, and got her accused of adultery and exile. She later sent someone to kill her. Agrippina really needed to catch a man. Her first attempt was service of Sulpicius Galba, who succeeded Nero as emperor, the first who was into the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Galba already had his eye on the emperor, which he ultimately did, and he needed someone bland beside him, not a light being rod like Agrippina. She struck out for points for perspicacity. She had apparently made such a, so much of an obvious pass at her, him that his mother in law his mother struck her in public for flirting. Anyhow, she was pretty good at knowing what she was doing, Agrippina. She knew where he was headed. She bagged the next candidate, an older rich guy, Gaius Seleucius Vecinus Crispus. Her rival for his favors was a beech tree on his estate, 
which he would caress and kiss and pour out wine for. He obviously came to prefer the lovely Agrippina to both the tree and his current wife, whom he divorced to marry Agrippina in 41. It's not recorded what the beech tree thought of that. Bessianus died some time before 47, leaving Agrippina a very wealthy woman. No comment. Much of her original assets had been taken from her during her exiles, but Claudius had returned the property Caligula had taken from her. Claudius swore off women after the Messalina mess, but Agrippina lured him anyway. She'd been through a lot in life so far. The exile and death of her mother and her brothers when she was in her teens, her father's death when she was only four years old, debauchery forced by Caligula or otherwise, the death of her last husband and her own exiles. I mean, consider. She'd come through the fire with strength and confidence. She felt free to visit Claudius, who was her uncle after all, at any time and talk happily with him on any subject. Tacitus reports that she would freely kiss and pet him, and it had a noticeable effect on his passions. Claudius had to ask the Senate for permission to marry Agrippina, since they were uncle and niece. Up stepped a servile and most convenient Vitellius, who was even then laying up credits with Claudius for a future emperor bid. He gave a silver tongued and electrifying address to the Senate, making it seem as if the very existence of Rome depended on Claudius enjoying legal intercourse with Agrippina. Permission, of course, was granted. Some senators even ran out in the street to show their enthusiasm to everyone. And so Agrippina became the empress. Like Livia, we are not talking Empress Wu here. Um, Livia had enormous power as an empress, but that was Livia. Um, usually it wasn't that much of a deal to be the empress, you know, in terms of power and politics. Like Livia, though, she faced another struggle. Of course, she wanted her son to be the emperor, wouldn't you? Her early marriage to Ahenobarbus had resulted in a son called Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus. After Agrippina's marriage to Claudius, he changed his name to Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Drusus, Germanicus, thus laying out his direct descent from Tiberius and from Augustus. Messalina's son, the one you saw holding her in the slide, was named Tiberius Claudius Caesar Britannicus. He too could flaunt his ancestry. And the Britannicus Carnomen had been awarded to Claudius' suppression of Caractacus's rebellion in Britain. Claudius hadn't actually fought in Britain, though he led the march to the site of the peace treaty signing. But his dedicated and persistent general, Osorius, had waged nine years of grueling war before capturing the British leader, whom Claudius pardoned along with his family when peace was made. Other rebellions in internecine wars had erupted in Roman provinces and vassal states from Armenia to Britain to Gaul to Hispania. Neither Tiberius in his later days nor Caligula had concerned themselves with stabilizing the empire. Somehow, Claudius managed to preserve it. Also, to his credit, he reformed the legal code to make the laws less brutal. This one example, slave owners who abandoned their elderly slaves to die on a deserted island or refused to treat them when they were sick were subject to the same penalties as murderers. Uh, could I add uh, something here? You sure? Uh, Jen. Uh, yeah, just wanted to mention that the BBC series that was mentioned, I Claudius, is based on the book by uh, Robert Graves. And it that's really, a, it's a fictional book, but based on uh, most of the history, uh, this, uh, it's basically illuminates this whole period we're talking about. Uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. And and the other thing is, the uh, one of the achievements uh, uh, of uh, Claudius is uh, what they call reconquest of Britain, because Britain first was uh, uh, invaded by uh, Julius Caesar, but uh, it didn't last. Uh, uh, they uh, he left uh, 
contingent there, but eventually was destroyed. Uh, and Rome uh, uh, didn't have any presence in Britain. And um, uh, it was one of the ideas uh, to, to reconquer this thing. And once he reconquered, once the Romans moved into Britain and, and caught a, uh, conquered part of it, yeah, that, that's when the uh, Caracatas uh, organized the resistance. You know, it was a very uh, uh, talented, uh, apparently, leader uh, who avoided the capture, and uh, it lasted for quite a long time. Uh, also pretty interesting thing, and uh, you know, just just wanted to add this uh, part of uh, things information. Thanks. Greg, can I ask you a question? Um, and then maybe a Jane too. Now, around this uh, time, and maybe a little earlier, you have many revolts, and you know, Armenians, Boudica, um, you know, all these revolts. That is this because the Roman is getting weaker? I mean, why do we have so many successful, so to speak, rebellions going on? Uh, where earlier there was, you know except maybe for, you know, Spartacus, you really don't have, you know, a lot of the, you know, prevalent, you know, tribal, you know, uh, or whatever, whoever Britons basically rebelling against or the, uh, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxons rebelling against the, uh, um, rebelling against the Romans. What, what is that attributed to? Uh, or because they're letting, you know, federales in, inside the Roman, uh, um, you know, territory. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. They, it's they, they, that didn't happen yet. It's at, at least at the time of the uh, Claudius, uh, they uh, simply revolted because it's a fight for independence. They usually on the fringes of the empire. I mean, they just been recently conquered. They still have not been broken completely, but eventually Romans uh, suppressed all of those uh, uh, revolts very brutally and very steadily. Yeah, the most important one, right? I mean, not important, but the most, you know, I guess more on the um, Asian side, right? The, the, the Jewish, Judea revolts. And that was or also around the same area, the same time, so to speak, you know. Uh, a little, little later. 66. So, right, 66. Yeah. You know, but then, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, Bar Koba and all that other stuff. Oh, that's already at the time of Adrian. Right. Okay, well, sorry. part of it was the fact that when the cat's away, the mice will play. And I mean, with Tiberius uh, and on Capri amusing himself and Sejanus completely taken up with his plans to uh, be the emperor, you know, who was running the show? And Caligula the same. Can I and, ask a very strange question? <laughs> Is this confirmed that, uh, you know, I guess... Uh, Caligula, you know, uh, Nero, you know, was has something to do with Caligula's existence. <laughs> I don't know if that's the truth. I don't know if, or the other way around. I mean, uh, you know, and also the, the sister sleeping, Caligula and um, uh, I guess Agrippina and the other sister that committed suicide. And then obviously the Caligula's um, uh, brother-in-law that eventually they said that killed him or had something to do with being, you know, eliminating him. Now, is it how truthful all these rumors uh, of this sycophant, so, so to speak? I don't have any information other than what's in the guise that I quoted. And I don't think they don't even agree with one another. So you can figure, you can try to figure it out, but uh, there's no, we're never going to know the absolute truth, just the most probable. They said that Caligula was pretty popular with the uh, general populace, um, as you know, as Caesar. And uh, the history is written by winners, so therefore, you know, the people that killed them obviously had uh, had some to say uh, to disparage them, so to speak. Greg, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, Caligula was popular only because of the popularity of his father. He, he is uh, his father had the reputation and everybody expected that the son would be the same way as a great warrior and everything but he uh, you know wasted all that capital and political capital very fast and so uh, maybe the first year he was popular but then uh, uh, later on and especially they say after the death of his sister Drusilla he completely went uh, crazy I mean he probably was uh, seriously uh, psychologically disturbed. 
I see. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, obviously, you know, some of his stories are crazy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Okay. Um, all right. So we're talking about the good things that Claudius did, and there were plenty of them. So just one example, slave owners who abandoned their elderly slaves to die on a deserted island or refused to treat them when they were sick were subject to the same penalties as murderers. We should have had that here when, way back when. When he spent money, it was for needed infrastructure like breakwaters at the Ostia Harbor or a new aqueduct to increase the water supply, a new canal to improve shipping. One of Agrippina's project was to found a colony for retired legionnaires in Germany, which was named the Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippinensium. Today it's called Köln or Cologne. Claudia rewarded her, Claudius rewarded her help and achievements with the title of Augusta, the first title to be so awarded while the emperor was still alive. Even so, Tacitus doesn't like Claudius. He attributes all of the good stuff to suggestions for, from Agrippina and his freedman, Pallas, who may have been Agrippina's lover, and Narcissus. However, even if his suggestions, this is coming from me, came from others, Claudius must be credited with picking those others and giving final approval to their ideas. In other regimes, they would be called advisors. But whatever evil, whether he was an evil genius or advisor, Claudius' last 10 years, there is no question that Agrippina and the freedmen were running the show. All was not rosy, however. Claudius executed 35 senators and 30, 300 knights and quites during his reign of 13 years, according to Suetonius. The number of plebes killed isn't mentioned. Among the domestic issues was the succession to the throne. Britannicus was three years younger than little Nero, and there were some whispers about his paternity. On the other hand, Claudius adored both him and his sister Octavia, and Messalina's ancestry, hence Britannicus, was even more impressive than Agrippina's. So it would be an uphill battle to put Nero on the throne unless he could get a piece of that impressive ancestry which he could do by marrying his half-sister, Octavia. That would make all of her Octavian progenitors his own. Octavia was betrothed to a wealthy and appropriate patrician, Lucius Solanus, who was close to the imperial circle. Agrippina asked Claudius to break the match, which he was entitled to do, but he refused. She then put Vitellius to work again. Vitellius' son was married to Lucius Silanus' sister, Julia, so he could testify to the affection between the sibs. Ah, could it be incest? Surely not. Definitely not behavior appropriate for the husband of an emperor's child. The wedding was canceled. On the day it should have happened, Silanus killed himself. Agrippina was now at the peak of power, but always uneasy is the head that wears a crown. Agrippina was not as uneasy as she should have been. She was getting arrogant and careless. Agrippina made the mistake of treating Claudius as freedmen like subordinates, particularly Narcissus. Pallas had been very useful to Agrippina in her quest to marry Claudius because he was jealous of Narcissus' influence with him. Narcissus retained Alliated by inciting Britannicus against his stepmother, who was now Agrippina. Things came to a head at the celebration for the initiation of the tunnel from the Fusine, well, actually the other word around, from the Leary River to the Fusine Lake under Mount Savino to control flooding and open new land for agriculture. And by the way, if you want to see an example of Roman engineering, take a gambling at this. The tunnel was over six kilometers long, and a longer one wasn't dug until 1871. For some reason, Narcissus was given supervision of the tunnel's construction. When the tunnel was to be opened, there was a huge gathering to celebrate the event. A mock naval battle was to take place on the lake 
But when the valve was opened, the shock of the incoming water spilled the boats. Sailors were injured and some were drowned. Agrippina screamed at the freedmen and called him incompetent, Narcissus that is, and other things that weren't good. With Narcissus spreading rumors about her in palace and tearfully embracing Britannicus while lamenting his demotion from crown prince, Agrippina's position was becoming shaky. She knew permanent safety would come when she put Nero, her much loved son upon the throne. And quickly, before Claudius began to take Narcissus seriously. In 54, according to Tacitus, she sent for Locusta, the local private poison provider. Agrippina didn't want death to come too suddenly and bring suspicion, or too slow in case there was time for a sentimental turn towards Britannicus. Locusta cooked up the perfect formula and Agrippina fed it to him in a bowl of his favorite mushrooms. He became weak and violently ill with gastric pains, and everyone assumed that he was dying, while Agrippina caressed and comforted little Britannicus beside the deathbed. But suddenly, to Agrippina's horror, Claudius recovered, totally. Agrippina thought fast, and so at her behest, Claudius' doctor put a feather down his throat to elicit a precautionary emesis. The feather was dusted with a quicker strychnine and Claudius ascended to divinity. Or so it is in Tacitus. Of course, every mushroom hunter in the world knows will recognize the clinical course of Amanita phylloides poisoning. The death cap mushroom is common, very large, very attractive, and almost identical to a very edible, delicious one. A few hours after the ingestion, there is horrible gastric pain from which the victim makes complete recovery only to die a little, a day or so later from multi-organ failure. And really the only way you can tell this apart from the good one is this little tattered remnant of when the cap was connected to this part. And you have to dig them out completely before you, you can tell. If they're broken, forget it. Perhaps we should give Agrippina the benefit of the doubt on this one. Claudius' death saga might have been due to sloppy mushroom poison. By the way, Claudius had rescinded taxes for this particular doctor's whole community at his particular request. Gratitude really wasn't a big thing in Imperial Rome, staying alive was, but publicly poisoning the emperor would probably result in getting killed yourself a very, very short time after. And now we have my very last slide. Oh, before you go, uh, just to give a credit. I'm not going to, yet. No, no, before you go to the next one, uh, uh, you know, to uh, Nero, uh, just to give a credit to, some credit to um, Claudius, uh, it, it is important to note, I mean, he also was a, a, a prolific writer. Uh, yes. He, he wrote... Uh, uh, 20, 20 books of Etruscan history, history of uh, Augustan rule, and also history of Carthage, uh, so of eight eight volumes. So he he was really um, uh, you know pretty. Uh, he was a scholar, you know, uh, uh, in addition to everything else. Uh, unfortunately, not none of his work survived, you know. But he uh, definitely is mentioned by other authors. Uh, uh, about all of that. So just wanted to give that little dimension. Well, oh, yeah, I had mentioned in written history. I had no idea that it was that much. I did a slight search for stuff that he'd written. I couldn't uh, find anything. It, it was not survived. It didn't survive. But the only th the reason we know about this is it was mentioned by other authors, uh, uh, by Pliny, uh, uh, it was mentioned, and Suetonius, uh, uh, so about all that. But we, we don't have it. 
But during yeah, the Caligula, uh, Caligula time, when he was trying to eliminate as many opponents as he can, he wasn't, he didn't touch Germanicus' brother. I mean, I, that that's the funniest, even though, because I think they were embarrassed of him that he had so many deficiencies. Uh, no, I think leader. he was beneath notice. Everybody thought he was a jerk mm -hmm. and would, would never be competition for being emperor. And I think that's how he survived as long as he did. But he also right, right. looked the uh, front upon he, the disabilities, right? He had uh, he was limping and uh, he pretended he, he pretended a lot of things, and he stuttered, and uh, uh, you know because he understood that that's his way to survive. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think. I think some, he had some of those things for real. Some maybe, but some he also exaggerated. Yeah, he, possibly, possibly a good policy as it was. Anyhow, he turned out to be more of a mensch than any one of these other guys. And this is Agrippina crowning Nero. Um, she assumed that he would let her run the show as she had during her time as empress. Nero was only 17 years old after all. And so it was at first, so much so that the young Vespasian, who had been given his first military command by Narcissus, was terrified when Nero became emperor because Agrippina had complete control of Nero and she hated Narcissus and he was worried that the hatred might rub off on him. But flies had already begun accumulating in the oil. Narcissus worked to estrange, estrange Nero from Agrippina. Once Agrippina was out of the way, Narcissus would control the infant emperor, he thought. Agrippina's mothering style did not help the situation. When children start to become their own adults, Wise parents generally get out of the way and let go and let God, except maybe for a few emergencies. Agrippina couldn't do that. Her years with Claudius had given her a habit of command, and she was described by her contemporaries as arrogant and inflexible with everybody, including Negro. The flashiest of flashpoints in adolescent is, well, you can put it in the chat. Let's see how many of you guess it. Well, Sex, how would you know? Agrippina had used her charms to snare Claudius and she could recognize the moves when they were made on Nero as they were by a freed woman named Acta. Acta must have been something special because she was with Nero all his life, although he had other companions, including wives, male and female. He'd been married for dynastic reasons, not by choice to his half-sister Octavia as part of the campaign to make him emperor. His second wife was Poppea Sabina, whom he kicked to death when she was pregnant. His last female wife was Statilia Messalina, who was a distant relative of the other one. And the final two were freedmen, the first of whom he castrated before the wedding ceremony. And Nero was the bride at his next wedding. Agrippina campaigned angrily and aggressively against Acta, sensing that her own power was declining as Acta's influence increased. It added to her anger that Acta was a mere freed woman, implying that she might support him in a bid to take the throne. Nero responded to that move by poisoning his stepbrother and rushing him into his grave in pouring rain without a funeral. For Nero, it became a choice between Acta and his mother. He tried non-lethal measures, at least let's give him that, to change her behavior, kicking her out of the palace, depriving her of her bodyguards, sending his friends to annoy her with lawsuits or make disturbances and jeer at her when she retreated to her new home, which was a villa across the Tiber. That didn't work, and Suetonius said he tried to poison her three times, but she took the antidote in advance because she had her spies. He then had her bedroom ceiling rigged to fall on her. But that plan fell through, and she emerged unharmed. He pretended to apologize for the above and invited her to the Feast of Minerva, arranging to have her boat rammed as she crossed the Tiber. Rather than allow his mother to return in a damaged boat, he offered her a new one, 
dish one fiddled with to make it collapsible, which it probably did midstream. But Agrippina swam to shore. It must have been frustrating for Nero. I feel for him. Finally, he pent a dagger on an unfortunate innocent named Agimus, whom he then accused of plotting to kill him at Agrippina's instigation. He tortured Agrippinus Agimus, into confirming this, then had Agrippina stabbed to death and announced that she'd committed suicide when her plot thus came to light. Thus ended Agrippina. Nine years afterwards, in 68, the inevitable revolt began in Gaul and spread to Spain, where Galba and his army joined the effort. All other Roman armies joined too, and the Senate voted to condemn the emperor. Nero prepared to flee, but loading on all his stage equipment delayed him, and he was trapped. He tried to kill himself, but was too chicken, and finally someone obliged. The dynasty was over, and Agrippina's old boyfriend, Galba, age 72, who had no Julian, no Claudian blood at all, would be the emperor now. The end. Very good. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody if uh, people have questions or, but this was excellent work. Thank you so much. Very uh, thorough. Um, you know, and again, Greg, can you mention the authors you mentioned on the, for that? Who, who, who uh, referred to Claudius uh, works? Yeah. It was uh, 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 Tacitus, Vitonius, and Pliny. Okay. I, I, I will butcher their name, but. Uh... Suetonius, Tacitus, uh, and Pliny. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and uh, the books uh, by Robert Graves, uh, I Claudius, I yeah, yeah. And, and also Claudius the God. It's two, two books uh, uh, that are basically describing a lot of this in a very entertaining way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Niclinia Pliny uh, with a P. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, Pliny. P, oh. P L I N Y, I think, something like that. Okay. Well. Yes, and Suetonius also, besides Tacitus. Yeah. Got it. Sue it like you feed, you feed the birds, and Onius like the usual ending of Roman names. Yeah, yeah, they they all refer to his works, and they actually qu quoted Claudius sometimes. Uh, all, all of these writers at some point on different things. So I'm gonna, uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna what? Mute everybody. Uh, so if people want okay. to ask a question, sure, sure. Um, and uh, if you want, you can just raise your hand, or you can just start talking. I guess uh, this again. This was really good. Um, so, anything else that um, Greg that springs to mind at those times? I mean, why? Uh, how important was Agrippina? You know, the uh, the younger and the older, um, obviously. You know, and um, so if you could just, I I don't know the uh, uh, the the younger uh, the older. Uh, I, I'm not sure if she was important at all. The younger maybe was important because she uh, managed to most likely poison uh, Claudius and put her son on the throne. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 Nero uh, eliminated uh, his um, contender, the Britannicus, the son of Claudius and Messalina. Uh, so he killed him and uh, became an emperor. So uh, they, they were actually a co-emperors, but he got rid of them pretty quick. Uh, and uh, yeah, the interesting thing about his uh, one of his wives, uh, Popea, uh, that Jane mentioned, uh, he actually, she was a wife of uh, General Otto, who actually became uh, uh, an emperor for a short period of time uh, during the war right after Galba. Uh, uh, so he, he took his, uh, you know, he made him to divorce and married Papea and, uh, uh, himself, uh, Nero was, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, also had a lot of idiosyncrasies. He considered himself a great poet. Uh, <laughs> he had what, all kinds of things. What did he say when he got stabbed? He said that, uh, well, you know, they're about to kill a great... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, he 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 actually uh, he didn't get stopped. He uh, he got stopped because he wanted to commit suicide, but he couldn't. He didn't have guts, so he asked his slave who was with him, the only one he was on a run already, to right. help him to commit suicide. So he was kind of holding the sword and uh, helped him. With regards to Pape, uh, the very interesting uh, situation <laughs> happened that he was. Uh, 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 when she was pregnant, uh, he he got upset with her and he kicked her in the stomach. So uh, she, uh, you know, she lost the baby. You know that uh, it was very impulsive, and um, uh, you know certainly um, uh, there was uh, uh, famous people at his court, uh, 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 like uh, of course Seneca, uh, uh, who was a philosopher and a playwright, uh, who was his teacher when he was young. And, um, uh, but um, he tried to uh, put some influence on him, but uh, he was not to be influenced uh, <laughs> by that time. What was, what was the story about uh, Agrippina? Nero was trying to drown his mother <laughs> and decapitate him. Uh, yeah, well, one of the things he supposedly con con uh, uh, made uh, changes as one of the ships where she was supposed to be on. Uh, uh, so that if you take something, the ship would fall apart. So, and uh, as they went out and sea for a, uh, you know, a little trip, uh, you know, he had uh, someone do that. The ship fell apart. A lot of people drowned, but Agrippina swam to the shore. She was a pretty good swimmer. <laughs> this happened. So, uh, yeah, so they had, uh, yeah, they had many things like that. Um, one interesting story about the um, uh, Caligula uh, when the, you know uh, he you know obviously you know when his uh, significant other passed away he dressed a boy uh, as the um, uh, as a lady and he walked down the altar to, you know marry a boy basically and uh, before that um, I think uh, castrated the boy uh, so it was just. A lot of the things that was happening is quite sick. What he was doing is just, and Nero was not. Yeah, the, the the most famous one that he made his horse a, a senator. Yeah, you know <laughs> that that was the most famous one. There was another one that Caligula apparently uh, he had like a fireplace, and then he would have one of his servants uh, go inside the fireplace, um, and they would start the fire, and then the screams from the you know a person you know getting burned alive entertained uh the emperor uh quite significantly so that one of the things that i mean there's a lot of yeah. orgies and stuff but you know a lot of the things also could be hearsay because you know people just don't you know the upper sure. didn't like them, you know so they made up a lot of the things as yeah. well especially him you know living on the island <laughs> having all this you know crazy yeah at, at least at the time of uh as i said at the time of claudius he he did uh he, he did conquer britain i mean that that was uh in those days of the uh expansion of the empire right. uh, uh you know that was a major achievement uh yeah, he, he added uh, sort of the uh, you know significant territories Right, when initially when Caesar entered, oh, not Caesar, I'm sorry, Adrian uh, entered Brit Britain, they said, we just came here to collect rocks. <laughs> so this was more on an expansion, uh, so to speak, inside the territory. But they still, you know, and again, the story about King Arthur had referred to the Roman times, not to the Anglo-Saxons at all. So, uh, you know, people are referring to King Arthur. Uh, not, not, not so Roman. Uh, the Romans uh, abandoned, we're talking about the fifth century. Right. The Romans abandoned Britain and, and the Anglo-Saxons started to migrate that. And I think the uh, story of uh, Arthur is mostly about the resistance of the Britons right. uh, then, uh, uh, against the, the, the somewhat uh, Romanized Britons. Uh, against the Anglo-Saxon uh, migration, um, so and it was unsuccessful. But you know, it all appeared later on. I mean, the whole story is uh, like in Middle Ages.
so anybody has any questions or uh, any uh, chord intrigues that uh, you guys wanted to know about? Uh, Jane, Jane uh, you know, Greg, um, you know, can probably shed some light in that regard. Um, I guess, is there any questions now? Keep what quiet. All right. Uh, Patty, any questions? <laughs> well, I was just going to type that um, the court intrigue stories made me so grateful that I have lived in the 20th and 21st centuries. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been committedly single most of my life, so <laughs> I just would not have been a happy camper. Um, but yeah, you really intrigued my uh, curiosity. I definitely want to follow up with uh, some of this literature and, and um, series. Yeah, so thank you, Jane. There's another thank series, you. obviously, if you want to see, we are quite a lot mentioning about the barbarians, you know, the Burka and Armenians. So the barbarian series, <laughs> Greg can attest to it, pretty pretty good as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Uh, Barbarians is about that, uh, 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 you know, the destruction of the fourth uh, four legions in in Germany by Armenians. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty fictionalized. Uh, I mean, there there is a lot of historical there, but they, they really changed a, a number of things there. Um, you know, it was pretty interesting. So, but uh, so that was. Um, yeah, the re resistance and a, lo a lot of the uh, uh, politics between various Germanic tribes at the time. So Keruski, uh, that Arminius was uh, uh, became a leader of, uh, was a minor tribe, but they, they relied on alliance with some other Germanic tribes. Well, when I went to Wales and, and uh, saw the um, Roman camps, I read up on some of this, and apparently... Uh, Rome was falling apart by this fifth century time. And uh, meanwhile, Britain was facing invasions, as you said, and they kept asking the Rome to send them more troops. They weren't really unhappy with the Roman domination yeah, after yeah. Claudius. They, um, they had camps, they had all kinds of places where the legionnaires had settled and worked their way into the population. But at a certain point, they asked the Romans, can you help us? And Rome just wrote back, you're on your own, kids, because they had their own problems. Yeah, yeah they, they withdrew their legions from there. They, they just, uh, whatever the locals organized, but they withdrew the uh, Roman army. That's why Anglo-Saxons started, uh, you know, yeah, they, they were falling <laughs> apart. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but we're talking about the fifth century, much later, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> So far, we were talking about the first century AD. Oh, no, that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting, right? I mean, and again, we can just talk about in general how vast the empire was, right? That, you know, since the Carthaginian Wars, it grew quite significantly. You know, before that, they weren't really interested in, you know, going outside of, you know, the Italian peninsula. Now they're military, you know, now they have a Judea revol revolt. You know, um, again, they're entering something unknown right i mean you you it's the first religion you you're meeting that's you know uh, uh that believes in one god so to speak <clears throat> you know all of a sudden you have this you know people that believe in something rebelling against you uh then you have anglo-saxons you know rebelling then you know they're afraid to cross the rhine because there's so many rebellions in in germany it's like almost you know they you know uh even during Augustus Caesar, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, it, you have, how do you fight so many wars? At one time when they had a triumvirate with uh, Pompey, Caesar, and, uh, um, and you know, Crassus, uh, they were fighting Parthians, Spartacus, uh, and they also fought, um, you know, uh, Pompey went and uh, suppressed a rebellion that was, you know, uh, had to do with, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, goals and also uh, the civil war that was going on. It, it's unbelievable. How did they even survive? Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be a proponent of Rome, and everywhere, every series, you, you know, you, they show Romans as being bad guys. But you know, but if you think of it, it's pretty, 
pretty crazy, thousands of years of survival. Well, it's mostly because they they were military uh, much more advanced. And uh, when they fought the uh, disorganized armies that just didn't have uh, tactics, uh, you know, they had a, an incredible uh, superiority. It's when they, uh, <laughs> when they taught the barbarians <laughs> to fight in the in the Roman way, that's when they got into troubles. Because, mm -hmm. uh, but that's but that's later on. The greatest expansion of the Roman Empire was at the time of the Emperor Trajan. You know, he was probably the greatest military leader, and uh, he expanded. Uh, so we're talking uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, he died in one seventeen. Uh, see common era uh, and that was the greatest expansion of the Roman Empire for the whole of all times and uh, uh, they fought many wars and they had a great military advantage over everybody uh, it's uh, you know suppressed you know he himself suppressed the revolt in Dacia you know that's a very famous um, thing so but it's interesting, you talk about different Roman emperors, you know, Augustus obviously, you know, wrote about stories <laughs> and Claudius wrote so many good books. But when you talk about Nero, right, uh, there was this famous story where uh, a Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, his name is Philo or Philo, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. visited Nero and said that there is a huge revolt going on where 20% of the population, which were Jewish in Alexandria, is being literally thrown into the sea. And can you help us? You know, and uh, he didn't even know what who the people were. <laughs> he was like, "Who are you? I don't know who you are." And uh, he basically threw, you know, Philo, who was a famous, you know, Greek Jewish philosopher, out out of the uh, out of his, you know, um, presence. He's like, "I I know I, I don't know you." So there was a lot of obviously emperors that were just pretty entitled and didn't want to learn the world, didn't want to learn, you know, the what was surrounding them, so to speak. Well, he wasn't a good emperor. He was, uh, you know, <laughs> mostly concentrated, at, you know, on uh, entertain entertainment and having uh, he inherited, uh, you know, a very powerful empire. And he, uh, you know, uh, spent uh, all of that. Uh, um, so and that, that as a result, after his death, I mean, obviously, there were no obvious successors. So there was a civil war. Uh, in Roman Empire, uh, and uh, that was the time it was called the a year of four emperors. So, because there are four emperors changed uh, exchange uh, in one year after right. his death, there was this Galba, uh, Otto, Vitellius, uh, and then Nerva. Right. Oh, no, uh, no, not Nerva. The Vespasian. Right. So, and once Vespasian came, that's the new dynasty, and it was much more productive, uh, stable. Uh, and uh, the Roman Empire continued. But yeah, it was a pretty bad period. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, Claudius' time was uh, kind of a revival, but then Nero spoiled everything. Uh, right. It, it's, 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 I mean, Cl you think that Claudius would, you know, had so many deficiencies, so he could, <coughs> but yet, look at that. I mean, he, um, he did <coughs> achieve a lot, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting period. At one time, they said the um, uh, Caligula, right? I don't know if how true it was, but he was um, he opened like a, a whorehouse, right? There was a uh, he would sell senators' wives uh, or make you know made them sleep with um, you know all the notable. That, that that's in the movie uh, Caligula. <laughs> yeah, so movie. we we yeah. We don't know if that really happened, but uh, but yeah, it could have happened. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, the the movie, the famous movie, the uh, experiment that uh, was uh, didn't work out. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, well, because uh, it, it had to be cut, it was uh, rated and, and C seventeen, but actually, the original version uh, included pornography there. Just uh, it, uh, you know, it's really. You know, even though there was a, a lot of great actors, yeah. uh, Helen Mirren uh, uh, played uh, what's her the wife uh, of Caligula, uh, Helen Mirren and uh, Peter Tool, <laughs> Peter Tool, uh, and uh, McDougal. 
Play it was Caligula. like in the seventies, right, Greg? Was that movie like yeah. in the seventies? Seventy yeah. seventy nine, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's well, that, that's when it came up. It's uh, it's, and I think it's a great movie. I mean, but I think the only, I, I mean, and they uh, they did a lot of cutting there uh, later on to uh, remove some of the um, pornographic scenes, uh, but uh, it's still uh, it's it's pretty. Hey, everybody! Uh, what film are we talking about? Caligula. Does it have cocaine in it? Oh my God! Here we go. All right, guys. I think we're gonna end it here. We have a zoom bomber here. Thank you, everybody, and thank Jane, you, Jane, again. Yeah, Jane. I just wanted to mention that when you put up that slide of the battle, that was my first thought: is Oh my God! Look at that sea of people. I cannot imagine that. So when you said it afterwards, I felt vindicated. <laughs> Greg, why are you so bald? I'm removing this guy. This is ridiculous. Thank you. So, okay, I'm so sorry, guys. I apologize for this. You get Zoom bombers sometimes, and uh, you know my apologies. Um, you know we should do for better security. But uh, um, again, anybody has any question? And we remove the Zoom bomber. Thank God. Yeah, I removed. You did. Okay, good. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else have any questions, or uh, wanted to add anything, or uh, want more information on any of the uh, subject matters? Again, please join our. Um, uh, um, website it's called Omnicara. uh i'm not gonna admit anybody at this point uh, omnicar.org and uh youtube channel i've also mentioned and um history of fitness investing together and then if you like our presentation uh you can donate um you know it, I, again that it's not necessary but you know even a dollar helps us to pay for zoom and we do in person, um, uh, in, in personal meets as well in New York mostly, but sometimes, you know, we, uh, we do, uh, um, you know, we invite the presenters uh, to go, you know, to the different museum outings and stuff like that. So um, any other questions? No? Jane, thank you so much for your um, incredible presentation. Yes, Thanks thank for you. listening. Bye-bye. I hope everybody has a nice rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you. You too. Goodbye. The Take next care, one everyone. We're doing. Jane. The next one we're doing is Jane still on? What? Yes, she is. So next, next, next powerful woman we're doing is the um, the what is it called? Queen Bernice. Yes. Okay, so that would okay. be somewhere around March, right? Right, end of March. End of March. All right. Thank you. Have a nice, have a nice uh, the rest of the weekend, guys. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.